Happy Heresies and welcome to the Desert of the Real. As you can see by the introduction, there isn't much of an introduction. That's because this is a brand new initiative from yours truly. And that is our first ever one-on-one -on -one video interview. Very excited. It's a new venture. There were a few mistakes and there's a lot to work on. But I'm so happy you're here with me to lose my virginity on this. Heresy shouldn't be this much fun, but it just is. And it was truly a delight to have Richard Smoley with us, a great friend of Gnostic scholarship with such great books as Inner Christianity. In this eternal now, he joined us for the interview to discuss his new book. A theology of love. The interview was conducted at the Theosophical Society in Wheaton, Illinois. Been a while since I've been there, and that's where Richard works from. Great energy and a great place to do our first interview. I've also added some B roll and other little surprises. And for AB Prime members and patrons at Patreon, who will be listening to the audio version, I have a great bonus for you. That is Roger Van Vlissingen. He is Dutch, just like Luthien, our webmaster, and a great guy too, who discussed in a past interview, which it's buried somewhere in the members section. You can't find it anywhere on YouTube. But anyway, he discusses the parallels between A Course in Miracles and the Gospel of Thomas. Excellent interview and a great compliment to our interview with Richard Smoley. So anyway, let us do the interview with Richard Smoley and uh, hopefully you will enjoy it. I hope it really helps you out. I really enjoyed the book and again, uh, I'm so glad you're here. It is truly an honor to be spreading this very important Gnostic wisdom in these Gnostic times in a Philip K. Dick world. Much of the content here, many of the guests, and certainly the guests' unique views, you won't find anywhere on the internets. And it is my job, as Philip K. Dick said, to give you that Gnostic Gnosis in trashy form. Not so trashy, uh, maybe with my introductions, who knows? But I think it's helping you out, and I truly appreciate those who support, those who keep me company, and everyone else who is here with us in the desert of the real. So on to uh, this first time great venture, this one-on-one -on -one video interview. Hopefully there will be more to come. I already have so many ideas. I may be living in Wakanda. Um... In the, in the Illinois countryside, close to Woodstock, where they filmed Groundhog Day. But my mind's already thinking of uh, peeps and, uh, and uh, guests and uh, great scholars and occultists that I know are in Chicago. So, hopefully more to come. But again, your support keeps this Red Pill Cafeteria not only open, but growing. And uh, we're in this together. Divided we stand, together we rise. And my little short intro that I thought would be short is getting longer. So, as I always say, enough of my drivel, as they say in France. And let us to the interview with the great Richard Smoley on his new book. A Theology of Love Hey there, here I am. Driving, or I am in Wheaton, Wheaton Illinois. Coming from the far north in uh, McHenry near Wisconsin. Very excited. I am almost to the Theosophical Society to meet Richard Smoley for Aeon Bites' first ever one on one video interview. This should be good. And God, it's been a long time since so I've been to the Theosophical Society. I saw Stefan Heller more than 10 years ago. I haven't been able to make it since then or just haven't made it. So, again, first time for everything. Nice day. Snow Turn is right. melting. Yes, thank you, GPS, for telling me where to go. And here we are. Quick turn. And I am entering the Theosophical Society. More to come. 
here I am at the Theosophical Society. Beautiful campus, great spiritual energy. I remember really enjoying it. They got a lot going. And we got, no, those are not ascended masters. It's like a lot of geese eating because the snow has stopped and it's melting. Anyway, going inside to meet Richard. This is the AM Byte interview. This is a first time for this show. We all have our one-on-one -on -one interview, and I can't think anybody better than uh, Richard Smoley, a past guest who has honored this show and been a great contributor to the Esoterica. Glad to glad you're here, Richard. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm glad I'm here. We are actually at the Theosophical Society in uh, Wheaton, Illinois. It's been a while since I've been here. I think I saw Stefan Heller last time he was here, but uh, it's been a while. And uh, the energy Richard has just released a theology of love, a book I really, really enjoyed. This book is not uh, the subtitle is "Reimagining Christianity Through a Course in Miracles: A Spirituality Based on Love, Not Fear." And like all your books, you sort of bring a lot more than the actual topic. I really enjoyed your takes on philosophy, the Kabbalah, the Matrix. <laughs> you brought the, the kitchen sink and everything. So um, why did you decide to write this book, Richard? I'm sure you I'm sure you decide to write this book before Marianne Williamson threw her lot in the race. I did. I did. Um, Christian theology in its current form is bankrupt because what are we supposed to believe? God got mad at the human race for eating a piece of fruit in Armenia 6,000 years ago. He got so mad at the human race that he condemned everybody to eternal damnation, except he kind of felt bad about this afterward. So he sent a part of himself down to have it tortured to death, which somehow made it all all right, except not really, because if you don't buy this story, you're still going to fry forever. Does that make any sense in any context? Of course it doesn't. Uh, it's phrased in, of course, elaborate theologies and rituals and doxologies, but it's still a ridiculous story. And it's easy to understand how this doctrine evolved over the centuries, historically. But that doesn't mean that in the end it makes much sense. Uh, and... Christianity is now facing a point where it has to confront this because it no longer has um, social power, the political power, or the intellectual power uh, to maintain itself. So what you have now is basically a more liberal theology, uh, which actually includes a lot of Catholicism and uh, literal mainstream Protestantism, which, you know, I haven't really chucked it but they're not like beating people over the head with it. And, you know, fundamentalist evangelical Christianity, which still pretty much sticks to the story. Um, and neither of these is doing too well. So there has to be something, some coherent theology that comes out of this. And the only one that I've ever found is in A Course in Miracles. So that was the germ of uh, this book. And uh, it's interesting, as you address in this book, if somebody were to call you a Christian, you've answered yes. If you understand a Christian to be someone who uh, attempts to follow the teachings of Christ in the Gospels, uh, and not necessarily all the baggage that came after, uh, and a lot of the baggage came after, as we can see pretty much in every news item or every news day uh, really quite contradicts that. Uh, it might be interesting to tell a certain uh, type of Christian today that uh, one of Christ's sayings needs to be updated. They that live by the gun shall perish by the gun. <laughs> um, so that is kind of where it comes from. Of course, in miracles, which we can discuss, uh, uh, at greater length uh, later, does actually present a coherent theology. That is to say, everything makes sense if you accept its premises. It is logical. Uh, and it actually probably offers the only hope for Christian theology uh, that 
we're going to see in the, in the near future. I guess, uh, I think as we've discussed, I did read The Course in Miracle many years ago. My aunt is uh, an advocate. She's been a follower, so it made completely sense. Even later, when I got interested in Gnosticism, I didn't see any conflict between A Course and Gnosticism at all. I mean, just makes perfect sense for this modern world. And again, as we talked about, you bring in The Matrix and sort of the, the issues about understanding reality today that are confounding people are searching for and obviously of course in miracles really addresses it so you brought up the fall of man in traditional christianity two naked people eating a piece of in armenia now i know where it was um what is the cosmology of a course in miracles or more like it the the fall of man well let me tell the genesis story in another version uh, let's say this man and this woman came to God one day and said, you know, hey God, um, we heard about this thing called good and evil, and it sounds kind of cool, we kind of like to try it. And God said, that is not a good idea. I did not suggest that you do this. And they said, oh, come on, we want to. And God said, all right, uh, I'm going to give you what you want, but you're going to have to uh, live in a world where uh, you have to work hard for a living, and it hurts to have babies. In travail shalt thou give birth. By the sweat of thy brow thou shalt earn thy bread. I've just told uh, the story of Genesis in a metaphysically true way. Because one thing I can say about you, I know each other a little, I can say about any of uh, whoever listens to this, ever going to listen to this, you have known some good and some evil in your life. So have I. So has everybody who's ever lived. Yeah, I know the proportions vary wildly, and that's another subject. But there's nobody so miserable that hasn't, that he hasn't experienced some good. Conversely, there's nobody so lucky or blessed who hasn't experienced some evil. So the human race chose to know good and evil. It is a big, big question whether this was, shall we say, a good idea or not. And there are varying answers theologically. Some speak of this as kind of a, a huge mistake. And A Course in Miracles basically treats it that way. This is this really something that um, shouldn't have happened. Um, you're stuck in it now, and we're trying to help you get out of it. There are more... Uh, optimistic versions, like, for example, Theosophy, which says, well, this was a necessary step, you know, in human evolution. Humanity had to learn the lessons on this particular plane. Uh, I would be very resistant to jumping to any conclusions about uh, which of these happens to be true. Myself, I have to say, I'm, I guess, a lot more convinced of the problematic nature of human existence uh, rather than, you know, it's all just some wonderful, um, you know, uh, grade school that, uh, you know, we should be really a lot happier to be in than um, we often seem to be. That is almost a matter of personal taste. Uh, but Wittgenstein said that the world uh, consists not of uh, things but of facts. You could almost take it further and say the world consists of problems, and that's what A Course in Miracles is. You're, and it's uh, focused very much on just the idea of problems. And notice how problematic <laughs> it, it all is, because you have a big problem, it's solved. And miraculously, almost, another big one appears to take its place. Or what was second place suddenly gets, and there's no end of this list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm struck by that, and uh, that's, I would say, affected my thinking. Yeah, and I love, uh, I love the mythology. I love mythologies. And, uh, of course, in Miracles, as, of course, the, like the Gnostics, the, the pre-creation mythology where you have God and the sun, and he has, what, that one tiny mad idea? Mm -hmm. And the idea was that he could exist without God or he'd be separate without God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the idea is that this is fiction. Uh, 
as you say, it's a tiny mad idea, but it possessed enough power to give rise to this world that we live in. And this world, it can't be totally, it can't be totally evil, because if it were, it would be totally separate from God, and it therefore could not exist. Uh, but uh, it's partly evil, and it's partly good. And this is, is it, is, is it basically good and evil? Is it basically good? Is it basically evil? It's a mixture of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And that is a fundamental reality uh, that we know. It bothers us, but it's almost impossible to conceive of reality without it. In fact, as I say in the book, it's very hard to even imagine a world that's desirable without some evil. Uh, and if you think about it, many people will say over and over again, you know, how boring heaven sounds. You know, floating on these clouds and harps or, you know, praising yeah, God yeah. endlessly or, you know, maybe there's some more pleasurable versions where you're eating lots of fruit and petting lions and tigers. But Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison, they're down in the <laughs> school well, people. Are down yeah, there. That's, it, it often comes across that way. So we, we, find it hard to imagine a world that's at all interesting without evil. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. uh, and yet we wonder why there's evil in the world. So I think anyone who says the world is basically good or basically one or basically the other is mistaken. Uh, it, 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 it basically what is com uh, what composes uh, the world we know. Uh, and this explains the nature of, of evil. Uh, so. Yeah, it certainly reminds me of, obviously, the, the Manichaeans and the Zoroastrians. We are a mixture of good and evil, or the cult of Orpheus. We are Dionysus and Titanus and this mess. But it seems, of course, a miracles, and I love this, it takes it even almost more radical than any other movie, because it, it says there really is no reality outside of God. They have The dictum is really beautiful. God cannot be affected, so, you know. Why are we worried about this since God is fine and we're fine if we just lift this veil of illusion? And this lifting the veil of illusion is the mm -hmm. whole thing. Mm -hmm. And of course in miracles, basically part of it is a 365 day workbook mm -hmm. in at least starting to lift the veil. Now the central message of the course is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now why would that be? Now, uh, I was reading a, uh, something by a woman who worked for a long time as an audio producer. And she said, you know, things on forgiveness never really sell. Um, because it's always a bit like medicine. You know, we, oh, we, we know we ought to do it, but it always feels unpleasant. And, um, everybody's a little bit stingy in, in, in regard to that because, you know, my, I'm giving somebody they really don't, do something they really don't deserve. <laughs> uh, and, it might make me a great guy, but um, uh, it always feels a little bit um, clouded. Mm -hmm. Now, so there's a lot of baggage around forgiveness. And from our point of view, it might be better to look at it from just a slightly different angle. Because if this world is, shall we say, a uh, confection of our own making, of our own cognitive making, mm -hmm. which we can get into, Maybe the first step out of it is not to take it very seriously mm -hmm. or to take it a lot less seriously than you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of leads to forgiveness. Now, uh, to go back to Genesis, uh, the man and woman were given coats of skin. Mm -hmm. Well, you're wearing a coat of skin, and so am I. If someone's watching the start naked, uh, he's wearing a coat of skin because it's this. It's the physical body. The birthday suit. The birthday suit, yeah. So you're, um, our vehicle for experiencing good and evil is the physical body. And if you think about this, again, of course, it's really quite logical. Um, all harm that you can possibly imagine is done to a body. Um, all of the suffering, all, it, it's done to the body. Uh, and if you can step past the identification with the body, 
uh, and many traditions have practices for doing this, and many traditions teach these lessons in many different ways. Um, you begin at least to um, free yourself a little bit, and uh, are you going to become radically illuminated immediately? Well, probably not, but um, you know it, it's you know the um, you know the chains loosen a little bit. And when did you uh, encounter a course in miracles specifically? Again, was, as I've, I've said, it with me, it was my aunt. I went to Lisbon, Portugal, and she was a different person and gave me this huge book, and I tackled it and enjoyed it a lot, found a lot of insight. Um, I first encountered it when I was moving to San Francisco in 1980, just after I'd finished university. Uh, and on the plane, I bought a copy of Psychology Today to read. This is a September 1980 issue. And it had an article on the course called The Gospel According to Helen. Mm -hmm. Like most conventional psychology perspectives, it was um, not entirely reverent or even entirely respectful of it. But I did think it was kind of interesting. And I saw the books uh, in a used bookshop about um, six months later. I bought them as a curiosity. I, they're three parts. Today they're published in one volume. Uh, and in those days, they were published in three separate volumes. The first volume consisted of texts, which I started to read and I found impenetrable. Uh, but they, I did notice that it had these workbook lessons, and I noticed they seemed fairly simple. And I, I just started doing them. And, you know, I did them for a for a year as as recommended. About six months later, I started to read the text. I started to get more interested in it. I figured there had to be some groups meeting uh, of people, so I found one. But there, there's certainly at least one in San Francisco. And I went to that for a number of years, uh, and so I studied it. I went through the workbook once, about five years ago. Later, five years later, I went through the workbook uh, a second time, and now I still rely on it. I sort of turn to it. Uh, I don't feel the need to do the workbook lessons over and over again, although some people do. I mean, there are some people who start every year, January 1st, and go through, uh, you know, if that's if that's what works for them, so be it. I, I don't even see that the course suggests you do this, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it's uh, flexible. If people want to, they can do this. So, uh, you know, today, uh, you know, I'm still at my bedside, uh, and... Um, if I'm uh, in the morning, if I wake up and I'm not really in such a great mood or feeling so great about the day, I sometimes think, well, I guess I need some strong medicine. So uh, <laughs> let's take out the course and read a page or two or do a lesson, yeah. or, you know, that kind of thing. I, I do remember a lot of the lessons and try to apply them in my daily life. So, um, you know, that's been, what, 38 years. So I, I guess I can say at least a little something about it. Yeah, indeed. And you said starting the workbook again, like, for example, I'm in AA and one of the challenges or decisions we have to make is you do the 12 steps. Are you going to go back and go through the gauntlet of moral inventory and all that? And it's painful the first 12 times and it's going to be painful the 12. Is, it, is that how the course book is? Is it a gauntlet or is it pretty a good experience? Do you have, I mean, do you have to face demons like we have to do and so forth? And well, there's always going to be some resistance that comes up. Uh, a lot of people find the um, first couple of months particularly challenging because the lessons are rather negative in that the world, I see a meaningless world. The world I see holds, holds nothing that I want. It's like saying I'm an alcoholic. Or, oh, oh, right, right, <laughs> right, right. right. Uh, and later they get more positive. Although, on the other hand, the first couple of months of lessons are very brief. You just they're really like a couple of minutes a day. Mm -hmm. Later on, they're kind of more extended meditative practices. So in that respect, they get more difficult. I would say, um, well, things are going to come up. I mean, and I, I really don't see any spiritual path in which a lot of your demons aren't going to come up sure. and they, they tend to come up in a big way, you know, as you're, there's first kind of a little honeymoon period. Mm -hmm. And when you're 
you know, you think, wow, you know, I'm really kind of committed to this spiritual path, whatever it is. Uh, then, you know, the floodgates start to open and you start, mm -hmm. you know, facing your demons. And I think that's, I think that's true with the course. I, I don't really think it's terribly different, um, in most other spiritual, uh, uh, traditions. In the Western occult tradition, it's called, um, confronting the guardian on the threshold. Mm -hmm. In Jungian terms, it's called facing the shadow. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, I think people in a lot of Jungian circles, by the way, this is a, a side, uh, comment, um, are rather naive about the shadow these days in that, well, I think the shadow isn't really evil. It's just all the stuff about denying right. it. Yeah, that's true. But a lot of that stuff really is bad. <laughs> it really is bad. Uh, you know, I mean, at least from any conventional point yeah. of view. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff that you're not seeing because it ain't nice. I mean, yeah, there are things you're ashamed of. Like, you know, I don't know. Right. You know, I'm ashamed of the way I look or blah, blah, blah. You know, stuff that's quite innocent. But that stuff, you know, um, there, as again, I mean, Solzhenitsyn said, yeah, the line that divides good and evil cuts through each one of us individually. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no getting around that. Yeah. The profane and the sacred are one and the same sometimes. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, well, they're mixed. Mm -hmm. they're mixed. Getting I mean, back to good and evil. Yeah. I, I, you know, you speak of the Manichaeans and the Manichaeans, saw their theology as, or their spiritual practices literally sorting out mm -hmm. the atoms of light from the atoms of darkness. Uh, obviously today, you may think about it in a little somewhat less um, chemical way, but uh, it still comes to the same thing. I was very delighted, Richard, because you brought in, of all things, you bring a lot in your book as we talk Kabbalah, Greek philosophy, uh, the Matrix is sort of a, a cultural anchor to understand A Course in Miracles, but you brought in uh, Philip K. Dick's Ubik. Tell us about that. It was, a, of course, I really loved it. Well, like all of Dick's uh, theology, uh, he's. He's, and, uh, he sorts through it all. He's, you know, mega work at the exegesis, mm -hmm. which even in a highly edited form is a pretty thick volume. Uh, but he, you know, was confronting an, an imperfect world, uh, a world that somehow deteriorated and decaying before our eyes mm -hmm. and a kind of Gnostic rescue from, uh, above. In that particular novel, you know, and kind of a, you know, a witty and also very, you know, mid 20th century American way. It comes in, the, you know, a product on a spray can, uh, which is ubic. It comes from the Latin ubique, meaning uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's one version of his myth. I mean, it, it's later on, um, particularly after his, um, shall we say, spiritual awakening in 1974, uh, you know, his, his novels start to become much more explicitly shall we say, theologically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he sees this world as the black iron prison and uh, any any anything that's going to sort of penetrate it has to come from without from a very great distance, as in the title of one of his novels, The Divine Invasion. Uh, so it's a very profound uh, thing. It's very similar to the course, uh, although, uh, you know, he has a much more paranoid edge to it, uh, uh, the course is, you know, you're really not in danger at all. You're never in danger in any real sense. So there is kind of more of a relaxation. As I say, you know, you're, you're able to take the world a lot less seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in Dick, it's, it's a lot more um, edgy. Uh, I, the course was published in 1975. He had that experience in 1974. He died in 1982. Uh, he could well have come across it, but I never saw any indication that he did. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, still embryonic. It was only really in the 80s that it started to, uh, the 90s, it started to become something like a mass phenomenon. But I would have been interested to know what he would have thought of it. And it's, uh, the parallels are very striking. And, you know, in a sense, the same thing is being grasped and described by two very different sensibilities of 
very different set of insights. And of course, every last person on Earth has his own unique insights and perspectives on it. So that's hardly a surprise. Yes, and um, again, you bring in the Matrix, which certainly has parallels, to, of course, in Miracles. But the question on the nature of reality I want to ask you, I recently interviewed Erin Prophet, who's uh, the daughter of Elizabeth Claire Prophet, and now she's gotten her uh, degree. She's teaching at the University of Florida, and she likes to teach, learn about modern religions. And she was talking about A Course in Miracles. We were talking very nice about it and its benefits, but... Her question is, she was wondering why people in the Course of Miracles argue about whether to help the world or not, if it doesn't exist. Well, the idea is, doing the Course is itself a way of saving the world. And one thing that is very, very clear, if you pay attention to the Course, um, you have what the Course calls your special function some work you hear that only you can do in this world. Uh, nobody else can tell you uh, what it is for yourself because they're lucky if they know for themselves. So, uh, and your function may be quite different. I think what happens, and people want to do something for the world, but it, it, it gets, um, you know, they, they do it in kind of very naive ways. One example is uh, whenever there's any disaster, all these people come to help. Do you know how to do anything? Well, no, not really. I mean, yeah, they need nurses and doctors and stuff, but they don't need some ordinary slob hanging around. Uh, yeah. Oh, and by the way, this ordinary slob has to be fed and housed. In addition to all the other people who lost their homes and their livelihoods. So they're like the second wave of the disaster. And that's kind of a naive uh, way of helping the world. Uh, you have to do it in, a, in a, a way that's, in a sense, true, that makes sense to you. And it, you know, it necessarily follows that what you do and what, I, and what I'm, what I do and what you're supposed to do, what I'm supposed to do are really quite different things. So uh, I think that takes a lot out of it. Um, you know, as I say, a lot of people quite saving the world with embracing, you know, some cause or another and, um, your work very likely has nothing to do with that. Uh, a problem, you know, the usual disasters and calamities, you know, the human race is um, predicting for itself. Um, yeah, those problems are there. Uh, uh, your job might be something quite different. And you have to know yourself, you know, you have to know um, yourself well enough to know what your own job is. To paraphrase a line of a Bhagavad Gita, it's better to do your own job badly than uh, someone else's job well. Um, because, every, and Hindu thought is very much um, predicated on this concept of dharma, which is law, but it's universal law. And your dharma, personally, is how you fit into that universal law and how you do it. In the Bhagavad Gita, it's Striking, you know, and, uh, this is a war. I mean, the, the, it starts out, the hero, you know, sort of the greatest warrior of his time is about to fight the greatest battle in history. And he realizes what a disaster and he kind of loses heart. And Krishna, who's the embodiment of the god Vishnu, says, no, it's your job to do this. Um, it's sacred duty. It's your duty to do this. Um, you know, for, for the story's a long and complicated one, but um, that's basically what it comes down to. It's his duty to do that. Yeah, well, sometimes when I'm stuck in traffic, I wish I had Krishna next to me say, chill, it's okay, everything's going to be all right. But what I really also loved about The Course of Miracles, as you talk about in your book, is who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. You write that Jesus was the first person who was able to see Christ in every other person. That's that's some that's a goal that I probably won't reach, but I'm amazed one person reached that. Yeah, and um, of course, you go back to Christianity as it is now. Um, uh, one of the great problems with it is that there's an enormous amount of um, interest in worshiping Jesus and comparatively little following what his actual teachings were. Um, but according to the course, 
when this problematic universe, this fall, which it calls a separation, doesn't really use the term fall, uh, occurred, which, you know, was time and space as we know it arose out of this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, there's not some, not some event in, in history's timeline we can pinpoint this to. There was a response. This response was the atonement, the restoration, you know, of all things. Uh, what is the, the old Christian term? Of a catastasis? Which means just yeah. that. Uh, the uh, Lurianic Kabbalah of the Jews uh, speaks of Tikkun, which is the same thing. Uh, there is the sense of a, shall we say, a, you know, the cosmic man, the cosmic human, you know, fell and was shattered in all these little pieces, which is each of us. And the atonement is putting it back together again. Uh, according to the course, and I, I, I'm going to tell you what the course says. I, you know, I'm personally agnostic about this fact, uh, uh, but as I and as I say in the book, but Jesus was allegedly the first person to really come to the full realization, take fully take his part in the atonement. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe um, I don't know that it's. True. I don't know that it's not true. I have no real criteria for judging. Uh, it, it, you know, Jesus remains kind of a powerful figure, but um, the whole point is, as the course very specifically says, is he the Son of God? Oh yes, along with you. Mm. So uh, he's simply realizing something that's already true of all of us, and the only difference is that we haven't realized it yet. So worship is not really, as the course also says, really. An appropriate way of responding, you know, he speaks of himself as an old. He allegedly dictated the course, uh, and he speaks of himself as an old elder brother, uh, for whom respect is warranted, but not worship. Which I guess would chuck out a lot of what considers itself Christianity, but again, it makes sense. Uh, my own personal sense, yeah. I uh, oh, by the way, and this is a whole different. Uh, Discussion. Yeah, there was a historical Jesus. There were people. Uh, yeah, I, I'm quite convinced of that. Just on historical criteria. Um, but that's another book of mine, which is how God became God. Um, but uh, and there are beings who appear, who are higher than the rest of us in some significant, appreciable way. And I, uh, we don't know too much about the nature of these beings because it's it's said. And I believe it's true that you really can't see or understand any level higher than yourself. So basically what I, I see uh, as a necessity is, like, all right, there are in, in beings of these levels. They are higher. Um, I Theologizing uh, probably isn't appropriate because it probably has very little to do with uh, anything. Um, I mean... Another book of mine, Inner Christianity, talks about this from a more, well, in more conventional Christian language. But um, this is basically the I am presence, the Christ within. Uh, and uh, I think the Gospels are to be interpreted esoterically that way. That is to say, the I am in oneself. I am is uh, the way, the truth, and the life. I am is the door. I am is the true vine. Rather than this man who you're supposed to worship. Uh, and again, that goes against a lot of what calls itself Christianity. Richard, you mentioned Jesus had to go through atonement. Atonement is important in the course of miracles, just as forgiveness is. But it's not the traditional atonement of flagellation and 20 Hail Marys. What is atonement in the course of miracles? Well, atonement is the whole process of restoration, mm -hmm. and uh, Jesus' part is only one part of it. And he regard he describes the crucifixion and the resurrection as basically kind of um, an object lesson. So, I, mean, I went through all of this um, uh, torture and whatnot, but it didn't really make any difference in the end. It was done to my body, and because my body isn't real. Uh, mean anything, and I, I, I came back, and I, my intention was to show everyone this truth, but everybody completely misunderstood it, uh, and uh, 
So his part was, in a sense, to play this object lesson. And the reason the story of Christ is so powerful, regardless of your uh, theological beliefs, is that it's the story of all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, the Son of God comes down to earth, born in the flesh, grows up, he plays his little part in his time, he has friends and enemies, and eventually he is uh, subject to a painful and humiliating death on a cross known as time and space. But it doesn't really matter, because this is not important. Um, you know, he just comes back in a higher, more glorified form. And again, as I said earlier about Genesis, seen this way, the story of Christ is profoundly true. Various creeds and things that were built up around it are understandable uh, from a historical point of view, uh, and uh, but they don't make a great deal of sense in and of themselves. And one of the key things that the Course uh, criticizes is the concept of sacrifice, because you're not giving up, you're not giving up anything that's real, you're not giving up anything that's all desirable. Uh, but if you go back to the time of Christ, they were bound to understand it this way, because the religion of the time practically consisted of animal sacrifice, whether the, the Jews sacrificed to their god of the Jerusalem temple, the pagans sacrificed. It was all animal sacrifice. There's a fascinating detail in a, an apocryphal text called the Letter of Aristius, uh, which has a first, generally dated the second century BC, which has a first-hand description of the temple. And one of the things the author of this was uh, impressed with was the incredible plumbing system they had to drain all the blood off. Yeah, because if you kill that many animals, and these are big animals they're killing, yeah, there's going to be a lot of blood. Somewhere. So, you know, everyone has this, like, really kind of Sunday school picture book idea of the temple, but they had to have this huge plumbing system to get rid of all the blood. Uh, and that's how immersed um, the religion of the time was in sacrifice. Uh, so the Christians were almost bound, the early Christians, and you see this, in the New Testament, developing in the New Testament, the early Christians were bound to see Jesus's uh, crucifixion and resurrection in that light. They they uh, they didn't understand religion apart from this concept of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And now, little by little, we've kind of grown away from that. And you know, most people would regard you know animal sacrifice as a you know pretty backward practice. Oh, agreed. I don't even want to think about the plumbing system of the Aztecs. I'm sure they were pretty. <laughs> they were pretty ahead of their yeah, times. They, too. they were very uh, technologically advanced. <laughs> so, uh, another you might say, I don't want to say analogy, but really resound with me is you talk about mirrors and madness, mm -hmm. and this is what we are, right? We're sort of in this mirror maze, and we think all these things are reality fragments of ourselves, mm -hmm. and we're just lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. The analogy I use in the book is that a man um, builds a box and lines it with mirrors. He crawls into this box, and all he sees is these mirror reflections, constantly reiterated all over the place. And he stays there long enough, so he goes mad, and he starts thinking all these other things about other people. Uh, you know, if he sees a happy face, he sees a friend. If he sees, a, he makes an angry face. He finds an enemy. Uh, he gets madder and madder and starts thinking he's one of these little things, uh, uh, endlessly iterated, and, um, you know, starts thinking he's at war with all these other little images. And that is an analogy of the human condition. Now, because the man is mad, uh, somebody can't just open the box and say, you know, hey, wake up, because that would just drive him still further into madness. So there has to be this shall we, gentle voice of awakening that comes from outside. And in the language of the Course in Miracles, it's the Holy Spirit. Mm. In the language of Dick, it's the divine invasion. Again, they're very similar, just, I don't know, uh, characterized. Mm -hmm. How does the Course in Miracles see the idea of death or reincarnation or the afterlife, Richard? Well, strictly speaking, and again, it's it's rigorously consistent. Uh, strictly speaking, if there's no body, 
Oh, death only occurs to the body, so there's no such thing as death mm -hmm. per se. Um, but nothing, nothing can happen. You could never die. In fact, there's a line that says, "Swear not to die, you holy son of God. Make a bargain you cannot keep." Um, that much said, the course is remarkably. Um, uh, delicate about the subject of reincarnation. Does not say that reincarnation doesn't exist. Um, and it even says that the idea may be quite helpful. Um, and it, it seems to imply that, yeah, there is such a thing as reincarnation in this world. But since this world is not real, reincarnation isn't real either. Mm -hmm. But it does seem to accept the idea that, yeah, you can take different physical forms as you go along. And reincarnation has become um, a very widespread belief in the United States. I mean, polls over the last couple of decades have shown that about 25% of Americans believe in it. I saw one poll in which um, the percentage of Catholics who believe in reincarnation is higher than that of the general population. Which, considering that their church explicitly denies <laughs> such a thing, is really quite striking. Yeah. And um, it says something about the nature of American Catholicism, which is another subject. And, you know, a, a lot of the Catholics just uh, know perfectly well how much they want to take seriously and how much they don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, but anyway, yeah, so it does admit that. Um, you know, hell is pretty much, uh, there's no external hell as conceived, but world can seem pretty hellish. I mean, even on a fairly ordinary level, every person you meet, you're subconsciously asking, is this a friend or an enemy? Which is pretty hellish if you think about it. Yeah. And friends um, are uh, often turned into enemies, or even so are still seen as potential enemies. I Last night I was driving home and I was listening to that 70s soul hit the backstabbers. Oh, yeah, wow. You know, uh, yeah, this is, this is the way people feel about life a lot of time, and that's that's kind of hellish. Uh, it's not, you know, maybe, uh, you know, this inferno or whatever, but um, uh, it's it's unpleasant. And what about the, the ego, Richard? How does the ego, is the ego real? Is it part of us? I mean, the ego has been so vilified in the late 20th century. I think the course... It's not kind to the ego, just like AA is not kind to the ego. Yeah. Um, it's really important with terms like this to ask what sense you're using the term in. Mm -hmm. uh, because, as you know, Jung uses the term ego in a rather different way from the Course. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's what the Course says about it. The ego is, uh, is itself the tiny mad idea that you're, that you're locked into this world. It is, um, the ego wishes no one well. I mean, that's, it, that's another moral The ego is the demiurge. Yeah. The it, is. About. it is. But the, and, but it's not an external, it's, it's our own cognitive structure. Mm. Uh, what I think the Course is saying, is that this decision to, to separate, or at least think about separating, uh, brought about an enormous cosmic shock. Uh, you know, a, a deep sleep fell upon man, as the Bible says, but nowhere does it say uh, he woke up. <laughs> and the ego is kind of is, is the sleep and kind of the stance we take in the sleep. And so we're talking about, a le like, this is, we're not talking about like a coma here. We're talking about, uh, a, a level of shock and oblivion so deep that it gave rise to everything that we know. And this is not, you know, uh, incredibly reassuring, but then you always come back to the thought, well, well, since it isn't real, you're not really threatened. Nothing real can be threatened. Right. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. So, um, and of course, is a long, uh, way, a, a method for slowly loosening yourself from the ego. It is, uh, you know, it does say that you kind of can do it any second, but, you know, in other passages it sort of says that, you know, it's a, 
uh, it's a gradual process and um, it's going to involve some periods of disorientation and, you know, uh, uh, shall we even unpleasantness, but, um, and I, I would say that's true. Ten, Richard, I think we started with uh, Marianne Williamson. Mm -hmm. And honestly, and I have made no secret about this, she would be my candidate for president. Not, not, there's not even, I feel that, um, no law or politician or party is going to save this country at this period. I do think we need a spiritual solution. I think we need a psychic change. And I think we need to find ways to this country to face our collective shadow and work on it. And I think she is. She is the best. What What do you think? I, uh, I guess I'll keep my political opinions to myself. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know Marianne Williamson. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I've never read any of her books. Mm -hmm. She and I did speak at a Course in Miracles conference in um, 2015. Mm -hmm. And we met only in passing, but I did watch what she did, and she does what she does very well. Uh, presidential things, I don't know. I do think she said some really very insightful things. I was, I only watched the first Democratic debate, uh, but I, I did notice that all of the other candidates are going on and on about, you know, the immigrants at the border. And she was the only one who said, well, what about U.S. policy in Central America that's driving people, these people? And it was a very astute point that uh, nobody else either had appeared to think of. So I think she's saying a lot of good things. And I, and I think, I, you know, I really welcome having her here. And I think, you know, she is putting forward an idea of an alternative. And I think, uh, you know, politics is going to have to go a lot more in that direction in future decades. I think it probably will. Uh, I guess I'm fairly optimistic in, uh, in that sense, uh, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's on uh, the same token, even as I'm thinking, when you think about New Age presidents, you could make an argument that Ronald Reagan was a New Age president. FDR, even Trump, isn't he from the Church of Norman Vincent Peale? I mean, it seems new age and occultism is more prevalent in American politics, so maybe we need something else. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, and uh, that raises the whole issue of um, the new age and kind of the thought power movement. Mm -hmm. And both of those were really very instrumental in molding both Reagan and Trump mm -hmm. as men. And which shows a dark side of this. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it, 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 it's Emerson's self-reliance taken to an extreme. If you're in control of your reality, if you shape your reality every minute, um, the idea is not totally false, but it becomes very, very easy to say all these suffering people, it's their own fault. Mm -hmm. You know, they should, you know, uh, uh, read the power of positive thinking and, uh, you know, get straight and get decent jobs like everybody else, you know, which shows total uh, obliviousness to, you know, poverty, suffering, disease, old That's age. That's what Mitch and, Horace had said, is the yes. problem with new age is that it's the victim shaming. It's your karma, your fault, deal with it. It's yes. Not simple, people need help. Yes, I, I agree with a lot of what he says. And, um, you know, I think there has to be a lot more uh, discernment and discrimination in um, using those ideas. True, though, they fundamentally are so helpful yes yeah, so. all right well we are at the end of the interview for the audience this is a, a very good book i'll have it on the show notes really enjoyed a theology of love and i uh, wish you the best with it and thanks for coming on the the first ever one-on-one -on -one video interview richard can't think of anybody else uh, better well it's been a real pleasure i really enjoyed it thank you a theology of love and there you have it, my beloved True Seekers. The full interview with Richard Smoley on his new book, A Theology of Love. Great work, and I really love Richard's insights on everything. Highly recommend this book. For everyone, whether it's YouTube or audio, you've heard the full dope. But 
for those who are listening on audio, well, specifically patrons at Patreon and members of AB Prime, you'll be getting our bonus, which is the interview with Roger Van Vlissingen, who uh, did this uh, interview with us many moons ago on the connection between the Gospel of Thomas and A Course in Miracles. I think you'll like it. I think it's an appropriate bonus. So again, if you're here on YouTube or you're just in the regular podcast uh, channel and so forth, please become a member or a patron at Patreon. Please help keep growing this Red Pill Cafeteria because we got so much more excellent content coming. Regardless, again, I hope you've enjoyed this first ever one-on-one -on -one video interview with A.M. Byte, Gnostic Radio, and I'm sure there'll be more to come. I have another, I have many other great surprises and initiatives coming down the pipe, and I'm so glad you're here with me here in the desert of the real. So thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self. Hello and goodbye as always. Mm -hmm.